Or is Professor Hausman? It's coming over. It's coming. Perdón, perdón, maestro. I guess I should put this on. This is for taping, and I guess uh, yeah. we need we need the uh, microphone on. I uh, well, uh, here. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's really, really an honor and a pleasure uh, to be presenting President Calderon uh, to you. Um, um, I, um, it's, it's, President Calderon is back at the Kennedy School. He's been at the Kennedy School twice, first as a student and, uh, uh, and then as a fellow after he left government and we had plenty of time to interact in 2013 or so uh, when, he, when he was back. Uh, before I present him more formally to you, let me acknowledge uh, President Juan Manuel Santos and his wife Clemencia and his son Esteban. Uh, they're also back at the Kennedy School uh, after you know, being president of Colombia and Nobel Prize winner and so on. So this is just to generate some, some expectations for the rest of the audience as to what we ex expect you to do uh, <laughs> after you graduate. Okay, so these are just you know, uh, our normal expectations. So, so um, President uh, Calderon will speak for about 40 minutes, I understand, and if he speaks for more than 40 minutes, he will miss his plane. Yeah. So uh, he will speak and leave, okay? Um, and then uh, he will be followed by Leonardo Garrido. Uh, and Leonardo, I'll, I'll present him briefly, but uh, his most important attribute is that uh, he's a Venezuelan. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Felipe Calderon served as president of Mexico between 2006 and 2012. Um, before that, he was Secretary of Energy and Director of Banobras, which is the Infrastructure Bank of, of Mexico. He was uh, the head of his party's uh, uh, representation in the, in the Federal Congress. Um, he uh, was the first Latin American president to chair the G20 meeting. So that's uh, an important change in the political architecture of the world, the creation of the G20, in which um, the Mexico is, um, is, is a distinguished member. He has been named champion of the earth by the UN. Uh, he's currently a member of the board of directors of the World Resources Institute, an honorary chairman of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, president of the Environment uh, and Sustainability Commission of the International Federation of Automobiles, among other responsibilities. And that builds on a very, very distinguished uh, environmental agenda during his presidency, where he made the environment very central uh, to his uh, vision and to his uh, uh, strategy. Uh, He's also president of the Human Sustainable Development Foundation, which proposes public policy alternatives for Mexico and promotes uh, low carbon development uh, for the world. Um, Leonardo Garrido, who will speak afterwards, is a development economist with more than 20 years of experience on applied economic research and empirical methods. Uh, prior to joining uh, the new climate economy, which is this institution that we're going to hear about, uh, he worked uh, for several development organizations, including the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, DFID, and USAID. Uh, he previously served as chief economist for a Venezuelan financial institution, as head of research in the Venezuela's tax revenue authority, and as empirical economist for a leading Venezuelan economic private consulting institution. And uh, because it's almost a requirement to be here, he's also an HKS alum. <laughs> so, so 
Welcome back, President Calderon. It's an honor to have you. Thank We're you. all to hear you. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you. Uh, I want to express my deepest gratitude to very brilliant Latin American one, Prof. Professor Hasman, for, uh, for your invitation, and President Santos, and Madame Santos, and Esteban. We have a tale to tell later on, maybe, with Esteban. But not today. But I'm really honored with your presence here. Uh, what I want to talk is about uh, the effort we are making in a group, uh, the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, which I had the honor to chair, uh, in which we analyze uh, a lot of uh, events that are happening associated with climate change. We organized in Mexico in the year 2010 the COP16, that after the failure that we registered at Copenhagen in 2009 that obligated us to try to redesign the way in which we could negotiate multilateral agreements related to climate change. One of the things we started in Mexico was the unilateral commitments. So all those commitments made by each country on their own in order to achieve a, a new step in this cycle. But the point is, the problems are still going on. Let me show you some slides. This is a picture about what was happening in the Atlantic like a one month ago. So you can see three hurricanes in a row uh, hitting the west, the east coast of the United States, Florence, uh, Isaac, Helen, and a tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico at the same time. These events, of course, hurricanes have been all the time, but these events with this kind of frequency and this kind of violence are completely unusual events. So the point is the weather is changing, as we all know. Is there any chance to turn off the light? Over there? Or, thank you. Yeah, it's on. Yes, sir, Carl. Thank you. All right. So if, if you need to claim some kind of evidence, which is the President Trump, for instance, say that, well, climate change, he, he first refused that climate change exists, and then he admits that climate change exists, but it's not due to human activity. This is one part of the debate. So I want to present this slide. This is the temperature anomaly in Celsius degrees, which is the right column. So uh, related with the storms, you can see that temperature has increased dramatically uh, in the last century. But the annual average of extreme events related with the storms have, has increased as well in a very correlated way. So you can see at the beginning of the century, last century, where we're like a two or three extreme events related with the storms. Currently, there are roughly more than 100 extreme events per decade. So definitely, extreme events are more frequent and more violent. What about droughts? Is the wildfires in California uh, last year, uh, others in Portugal, uh, everywhere? So what about droughts, for instance? You, you, you can see the anomaly of temperature, and you can see the extreme events associated with droughts as well, from one or two to more than 20 per decade. Uh, we can go over and over with the floods in, in Peru, or here in the States, for instance, this year. And again, this is the anomaly in temperature. This is the extreme events per decade uh, in the world. So what is happening is this climate change is happening. Is that associated with human activity or not? Look at this graph. This is the temperature on average on air, but roughly one millennium from the year uh, 1,100. One this is the, sorry, it's carbon concentration with ups and downs. You can see, as everybody says, that, yeah, there are volcanoes, there are other events in the air, but roughly has been stable, according to this graph. Temperature has been roughly stable as well. But you can observe that uh, during the Industrial Revolution, there was a change. So the carbon emissions started to concentrate in the atmosphere, and temperature also started to increase in a very dramatic way beyond any limit in million years in Earth. So 
human activity is clearly correlated, associated with carbon emission concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, so the evidence has been so clear, but we were observing after the COP in Cancun that the world was not advancing enough in order to tackle the problem. Um, we started to consider a group of people why? Why we are not taking action on that? The first answer was at the beginning, because uh, maybe we didn't spread enough the scientific evidence about that. Maybe, but the point is there is some kind of a skeptical attitude uh, around. And maybe the main argument was economic. Yes, for the people, there is a dilemma. For president, for prime ministers, for congressmen, for businessmen, it's very common to think that tackle climate change and take action on the environment implies huge economic costs. It's quite expensive. So I won't sacrifice economic growth if I need to tackle climate change. So that kind of rationality is behind the lack of action and the arguments against taking action on climate change. So the first action that was made was in 2004, 2005, roughly, made by Professor Lord Nicholas Stern, who presented the very famous Stern Report. And what Nick presented was that there is a quite straightforward argument. The cost of inaction today is several times bigger than the cost of action today. So let's say the net present value of taking action is really positive. But even though that argument is so clear, for a lot of people it implies to think, hmm, that's a very long term. Are you telling me about the consequences of climate change in 10 decades, at the end of this century? Oh, forget it. My election is in two years. So we continue to explore, and there were seven countries um, under the leadership in Europe from Jens Stoltenberg, uh, Prime Minister of Norway at that time, uh, and now currently Secretary General of NATO. And uh, here in America, the leadership of President Santos, exactly. Because Colombia was one of the seven commissioner countries that provided us with the support in order to organize the Global Commissions on the Economy and Climate. And with the support of uh, several economies and institutions, of the world, we presented a report in 2014, and last month we presented the third report related with what we call better growth and better climate. So basically, the model, or not, it's not a model, we don't dare to call, call it a model, but basically, the arguments of the report is this dilemma, it's a false dilemma. It is not true that we need to choose between economic growth or climate responsibility. Actually, for some of the people, the only way to get sustainable economic growth is by reducing carbon emissions. And I will go with the arguments of the commission. So this is a false dilemma for us, clearly. And it is possible to have better growth, meaning higher quality and roughly the same size of economic growth, and better climate at the same time. Where are these global economic opportunities? We are estimating in our last report that in the next two decades, there will be $26 trillion in opportunities or economic benefits related with climate responsibility. We're talking about uh, some, for instance, the social aspects. To prevent 700,000 premature deaths coming from air pollution. Every year, 4 million people globally premature death, premature die because air pollution. Half of them do air pollution in the streets. So we can reduce those premature deaths and all the economic value associated with that. We can create, we can create, we can generate revenues for the government in particular roughly $2.8 trillion related with revenues associated with pricing or taxing carbon and fossil fuels or eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. We can have higher growth, higher quality. We can generate millions of jobs, millions of jobs 
additional and associated with that, and we increase uh, employment and labor participation in, in even, of course, all those sustainable, sustainable development goals. But in order to get this higher quality, more resilient, more resilient and inclusive economic growth, we need to change, and to change now, and we are talking a window of opportunity that everybody is estimating by the year 2030, including the IPCC report presented last week, uh, the, the panel, intergovernmental panel on, on climate change. They are talking about the window of opportunity of ending by the year 2030. Beyond that limit, there will be consequences that we cannot avoid. For instance, uh, the disappearance or the extinction, to say, of the life in the coral reef. Coral reef in Mexico, the coral reef in Colombia, the coral reef in Australia. So it's going to be possible to recover, even do all the things we need to do after 2030. So what are those systems? Uh, first, the cities. We cannot continue with a model in which the city is like Mexico City. I'm sorry to say that. It's a sprawling model, growing and growing horizontally, but a never ending, which is inhuman and unproductive and very polluting. So we can, like, uh, in order to illustrate the example, we use these cases. One is the case of Atlanta, with roughly five million inhabitants, and the other is the case of Barcelona, also with five million inhabitants. The curious thing is you can observe and it's exactly the same size of the graph. It's the same dimension, the same scale in both cases. But meanwhile, Barcelona is deployed over 650 square kilometers. Atlanta is deployed over roughly 7,700 square kilometers, which implies that the people in Atlanta only commuting are emitting 10 times carbon emissions per capita than the people in Barcelona, 10 times. So straightforward consequence of that is the model for the cities needs to change dramatically. Of course, it's quite difficult to redesign and to destroy what is already done. But we need to consider that, for instance, in roughly 15 years, there will be one billion people coming to live in cities around the globe. One billion people more. So what are the kinds of cities and development we need to establish for all those people? It needs to be completely different what we have today. So we need more compact, connected, and coordinated cities. We need to change the mindset. We need to change the model from uh, cities oriented to serve individual cars to cities oriented to serve uh, comprehensive mobility, massive transportation systems, affordable, comfortable, and secure massive transportation systems. One of the best, or we analyze, for instance, in the commission, the metro, the buses. Um, the most cost-efficient system is the BRT, the bus rapid transit, the Millennium in Bogota, for instance. Depending on the size of the city, of course, but with a confined line, uh, for instance, you can mobilize several times people at lower cost and all those systems. Of course, metro can mobilize much more, but the cost for people is higher. So it depends on the size of the city. Or there are small cities in which you need to go all the way to pedestrians or all the way to cycling. But the idea we need to design cities uh, that allow people to commute in a comprehensive, integral way. You cannot, for instance, use the bicycle in Mexico. Why? It's a flat city. You cannot, because we, the drivers, are so aggressive and so stupid, and, and consider that the, the, the bicycle needs to be forbidden. No, we need to think a new model of cities. Otherwise, it's going to be impossible to reach a better climate. But the good news associated with cities if we can densify the cities in a rational way and to make them more human, it's going to be possible to reduce carbon emission, but also to make more productive cities. Better for the economy, able to create more jobs 
and both jobs would be more productive. One example for a waitress in Mexico City. He or she needs to take two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening going back from home, which is completely absurd and is unproductive. And you take the same time or half of that time talking about businessmen or politicians or academic uh, PhDs or whatever, you are talking in a massive destruction of, of economic value. So we need to change that. So the second system is, well, one example of the logic behind the new climate economy we are talking about. We need to think about all those measures in which it is possible to get environmental benefits, but economic benefits as well. And there are a lot of examples. For instance, retrofitting. If we can change the air conditioning system or the heaters in a lot of houses or buildings, or we can establish more thermic uh, <coughs> isolation in the walls or in the windows. You see, I visited Professor Ricardo Hausmann yesterday in his office. <laughs> it was burning, you know? Because there are a lot of offices here at Kennedy School just facing to the sun in the afternoon are so hot, you know? Uh, so just changing that kind of thing. The good thing is you can save a lot of carbon emissions by reducing the energy you use by heating or air conditioning. But also, you can improve, not only you can save a lot of money for that, but also you can improve the economic value. One example, I'm coming to my slide, is what Wharton School at the UPenn made recently, a research considering this logic. 60% of uh, electricity use is made in buildings and construction. If we switch all the way to retrofitting with those technical improvements associated with energy and isolation in America, there is one trillion dollars in opportunities, economic investment opportunities in the United States. We're potentially able to create more than three million jobs, American jobs. And actually, they analyzed the case of uh, Philadelphia, and they discovered that all those studies that actually have already a uh, retrofitting experiment, the real estate value for the owners improve a lot. So only for rents, on average, they discovered that 6% of increase in rents. And the price of the real estate increased by 15%. So again, the measure is good for the economy and good for the environment. That's the whole logic about behind those millions we're trillion we're talking about. Second system is the land use. It is estimated that roughly like 24% of total carbon emissions in the world are associated with either deforestation or bad practices in agriculture, agricultural sector. We can, with the current technology, to improve agricultural sector in order to produce more food and to feed in a better way more people the next three decades. And it's important, it's, it's, it's fundamental to widespread such kind of technologies. Again, some examples associated with this example. Well, one case in Yucatan, in Mexico, is a successful restoration in the land. So the project took a lot of agroforestry and other uh, technologies associated with the land, and that allowed 16% of increase in revenue for farmers. And also for cattle, produce, cattle ranchers, they are having three times as much the head cattle that used to, cattle head that used to have before. Just improving the quality of the soil, just preserving the quality of the soil. So President Santos, by the way, in his very brave initiative to provide peace for Colombia, that actually already is an historical achievement that nobody can uh, take out from history, is promoting a massive program of uh, in the land, in all those areas uh, before under war. Or, or the idea is to have a sustainable development project, and that is feasible and possible to improve the environmental conditions and also to improve the economic conditions of the people in those areas. Other example, this is in Africa. Somebody was made an experiment with drones, 
in order to increase the technology. So the profit they discover is $20 per each dollar invested. Uh, so with uh, yield increased by 1.3 to 1.6 tons per hectare. So it is possible, again, to increase the productivity and to save the land uses. The third system we need to change is energy, of course. For a lot of people, it's the most important. And I think that depends on the country. For developed countries, the UK, the European countries, it's quite common to talk about energy, and energy, and saving energy, and energy efficiency, and renewable energy, and that's right. That's, that's correct. But for a lot of developing countries, for us, we have no industry, to be honest, no? in that size. So the main change we need to do is related with land uses. But that depends what is the expression one size doesn't fit all. But the point is, energy is quite important, definitely. The idea is not to reduce, not to cancel the development, which implies the use of energy, but to increase the efficiency of the use of energy. That's the idea uh, behind isolation of the building. And also to switch towards low carbon use of energy. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible and it's feasible in economic terms. Some examples. By the way, these are the, the logos, or when you say yeah, the logos, of the sustainable goals. Uh, UN, and, UN and sustainable goals. Sustainable development goals, yes, right. Well, examples solar. When I was Secretary of Energy in Mexico 2003, uh, I proposed President Fox to build a wind farm in Mexico and a solar farm. And a lot of people in the government said, well, this guy is completely crazy about that. It sounded at that time like utopian, and to be honest, it was a little bit, but there is some kind of things that technology provides you at the beginning, some kind of, a lot of reasons to be a skeptical. Uh, you, you are too young, all of you, including you. <laughs> but when I was a student, there were no mobile phones. They were not computers. Maybe your case, no? They were not computers at all. Not in school. If somebody can tell you that there were like a, you can have a video conference in your phone, well, like a joke. No? But the technology can provide a lot of surprises to us. And that's the case of renewable energy. So I proposed that. I was accepted. My proposal was only. It was reduced from 500 megawatts to 98 megawatts. We built it. I had the chance to inaugurate the facility when I was president. Well, the, my point is this. This is the cost curve of solar energy in the world. So it's coming down from roughly 1,000, well, in the 90s, $1,200 per megawatt hour to 21, which is the last auction in Chile, $21 per megawatt hour. From 10 years from now, the cost of solar energy went down from roughly $400 megawatt, megawatt to $20 megawatt hour. Completely affordable, completely viable. And again, it's good for the pocket, good for the economy, good for the environment. Some examples? Well, this is the same case of wind energy. It's coming down dramatically. In both cases, as you can see, uh, so this is lines associated with some kind of hypothetical prices of natural gas and oil. So solar energy is reaching a quite competitive point against fossil fuels, traditional fossil fuels. Meaning, in, very, in several conditions, solar energy is cheaper than traditional fossil fuel sources energy. The same with uh, wind power are decreasing as well. Some examples, we in Mexico would say, this is my house, Margarita, uh, my house, and it's your house as well, as we in Mexico like to say, we mean it. Don't take it seriously, because you are, <laughs> but your house anyway. So we decided to establish some solar panels in the room. Well, what happened? Definitely we reduce our consumption, we reduce our electricity bill dramatically, uh, because there were some people skeptical about my argument, I exhibit <laughs> the electricity bill. 
when I went back for, to Mexico after staying here in Kennedy School, that was the bill, 4,200 pesos. Oh my God, I, I say all the things that people used to say about CFE, the utility in Mexico. <laughs> but worse, definitely. <laughs> so we, put the, we made investment. And this is the new wow. electricity bill. So again, see the argument. Good for your money, good for the economy, and good for the environment. So the payback of my investment could be roughly in two, in four or five years. For a long period, maybe 12 years or even more of those solar cells. So again, it's completely feasible, it's completely possible, it's good, it's the new economy, it's the new climate economy. Now, the renewables are the new normal everywhere. A lot of Americans are skeptical about that. But you can see, solar and wind are creating, or have created in the last four, eight years, four million jobs globally. And total for sustainable energy, more than 10 million jobs, including retrofitting, or in, not, including um, energy efficiency. Well, what about the states? The jobs, well, uh, Roughly half of the total new investment in power generation is renewable. Nobody, or almost nobody, is investing now in fossil fuels for power generation. With some exceptions, there are a lot of, yes, I need to rectify. There are a lot of carbon, coal, uh, new facilities, but it's a very bad investment, to be honest, because they are running the risk of the so-called stranded assets. You make an investment of 50 years long, maybe in 10, 5, or 15 years, you will be trapped. And you cannot get the payback from that investment. So the new investment is renewable. Currently, half of the total global investment is coming from that. What about jobs in the United States? Solar and wind are providing the income for almost half a million families in America. 470,000 workers in the United States are dependent in power generation associated with solar and wind. If you combine power generation associated with coal, oil, or natural gas, there are only 150,000. So three times as much associated with renewables. That is the new economy. When President Trump talked about the coal workers in the States, he is right in the sense that we need to provide them like a fair, just transition. But the point is that coal workers from the mine to the power generation plant are roughly like 83,000. Workers in the new economy associated only with solar are 250,000 in the United States. So that's a new source of economy and economic growth. Go ahead. Well. Um, the point is, there is in the new, in the new uh, report, it is included like another system we need to change, but I prefer to use in the old, old side we, we did in the first report, which is there are some changes associated with this structural transformation that actually, actually trigger the economy. So it's not only the fact that you can get growth, but actually changing could trigger even more economic growth. What is resource or natural resources productivity? We like to talk a lot, and one of the most brilliant economists associated how to foster economic growth is Professor Ricardo Hoffman. We talk a lot about the productivity of the capital, capital productivity and labor productivity, right? And it's good, it's fine. But we say, on top of that, we need to talk about natural resources productivity. One example, straightforward. We in Mexico, where we are giving by free the water. It's free for agricultural purposes. No, it's completely free. And the electricity for agricultural purposes is also almost completely free. What is the outcome of that? We are losing a lot of water. We are depleting the uh, underground reservoirs, and also we have a quite an efficient agriculture. What are the countries more productive in the agricultural field? Give me one. Israel. Why? But they're living in the desert. 
Because of that, because the natural resources productivity is huge. So we, if we take the natural resources, water productivity from here right to Mexico, we'll be able to feed at least, I know what I was going to say, the planet, but no, <laughs> uh, we're exaggerating, but that's true. Natural resources productivity. That implies to price the natural resources. That implies to stop the way in which we are wasting the natural resources. One example, what is happening in industry, sustainable industry? Have you heard about the concept of circular economy? For instance, there will be one day in which we need to forbid it glasses like this, and reuse the glasses, or no, a lot of examples, but let me go quicker because I, I need to finish. Uh, uh, steel industry, they are having 56% of savings coming from circular economy. They are recycling, they are reusing, they are improving the productivity using the very same, in that part, 56% of the very same resources they are using. What happened in India? Dalmia is a company. Uh, they tried to improve uh, the carbon footprint for uh, cement. They increased earnings by 70% and cost down 27%. So the point is they are reducing emissions, but currently they are increasing the revenues for the company. This is the example I used for water. Uh, a set of leading firms are investing, and they have 23 billion committed for that. Another example, the UK, they are saving more than $3 million a year from water management. So do you provide like a rational, I mean, it, you need to, to provide a transparent cost of opportunity of natural resources. Sometimes it's price, sometimes it's taxes, sometimes it's a way in which you need to increase the productivity of that, and that's good for the environment, good for the economy as well. Second, second reason, the new climate economy can trigger the economic growth, investment in infrastructure. That is a big, tricky question. Well, <coughs> President, but where that money is coming from to invest in such new plants and new facilities and new solar energy power generation plants, whatever? And the answer is, it's going to come exactly from the same sources that we are taking in order to finance the current high polluting model of development. So instead of build an oil facility, you need to build a renewable facility. Instead, instead to build an elevated highway in the city for more cars, you need to build like a, another community system, a BRT system, a metro system. But it's a public policy option. It's a very 101 rule of the public policy. You have not unlimited, endless uh, economic resources. You need to choose. Between what you need to choose for the new economy and the new energy and the new cities. Uh, what about that? We estimated in the commission that from the year 2015, the year which was analysis was made, to the year 2030, we needed to invest roughly $90 trillion in infrastructure associated with with cities, energy, or land uses, right? You do some maths associated with energy efficiency, power generation, the capex from fossil fuels, and you start to reduce here. The capex could be lower, uh, less transmission, for instance. At the end, you will have an estimated cost of 93 trillion, which is honestly, it's not a big difference in 93 trillion, but roughly it's the same. But even if you consider the net present value in the size of energy, which includes lower operation costs, because it's the problem with renewable is a prone investment. But afterward, it trends to zero. <laughs> the cost of the sun, of the sun, because of the wind, is completely free. So the net present value could be even higher, or the net present cost would be lower in the, in the case of the new climate infrastructure. So again, the lesson is we need to decide the kind of model of economic growth we, we want. But the, the resources are going to go exactly from the very same sources. Um, so the choice is for us. 
This is in China. I don't know how many lines you can take like one hour to count all them, but we cannot follow this model. Yes, we can invest a lot in order to afford all the cars. They were built and sold one billion cars between 1910 and 2010. There will be another billion cars between 2010 and 2030. Another billion. This is not the model for the future. So we need to invest the very same amount of money in another kind of cities and another way to commuting for the people. Well, finally, innovation. If you establish the public policy we are recommending, for instance, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, establishing price on carbon, and some kind of system could be able to tax carbon, or price and cap, or whatever, you can foster innovation. And innovation has been the most powerful engine for economic growth in history, probably. Um, well, we can do a lot with that with digital technology, smart grids, energy saving, can provide a lot in order to get the benefits economic and environmental of the new climate economy. Look, maybe you have been, you have seen this kind of thermostat, isn't it? Okay. So it's different from the traditional we used to have at Kennedy School, I remember that, maybe <laughs> over there. <laughs> this thermostat is a smart one. It's able to detect how many people are in the room, at what time, or what could be the weather for the day, whatever. So you can save a lot of energy. And again, the payback for this thermostat could be like two years. You can buy, you can have a $150 in saving per year. So you can pay back the thermostat in one year and a half or two. So the very same rationality. Public transportation, smart cars, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles. It is estimated that, for instance, electric vehicles by the year 24 it will be roughly like 24% of the total vehicle in the world. But if technology improves at the point that more uh, faster charging process, more locations to charge the vehicles, smaller batteries, long, longer uh, duration of the batteries, the electric vehicles could be roughly like 70% in 20 years. So technology is advancing in this side. Well, oh, technology could help us in order to, uh, well, it's a beautiful project I love very much, the World Resources Institute, which is for the world. You can check, I have not the web page, I'm sorry here, but uh, check it out in the internet. But the forest watch is a project where you can detect in real time what is happening in the forest right now? So for instance, this is the Amazonia. It's Colombia, this beautiful country here. <laughs> so those are, for instance, intact forest cover <coughs> or deforestation. Or there were fires over there. I don't remember where that. OK, but you can check it. Well, finally, uh, the evidence. Uh, according to the OECD, Uriah is also the member of the commission, they made some exercise for the G20, and they sustained even more ambitious st uh, uh, statement that we say we can create at least the same economic growth, but much better definitely. And Uriah and his team say, no, we can have even bigger economic growth for the G20 countries. And yes, they do all those numbers. It's so complicated to me. I'm sorry for that. I will skip that part. But the point is, at the end, they estimate that net growth effect by the year 2050, almost 3% beyond or bigger than the current inertial trend, and with those, some economic costs associated with avoided climate, climate disaster even bigger. But let's say for OECD countries, they will grow not only the same, but bigger, being responsible. That's the whole idea behind that. Well, I finish to say, uh, you have heard this expression. We can do well by doing good. Yes, we can make money, profit, trade jobs, alleviate poverty. And at the same time, we can tackle and reduce the climate risk. We have one of the biggest challenges of our era, and definitely the most global challenge the most global challenge of our era, which is climate change, but at the same time, it's the biggest opportunity to find out the sustainable and inclusive economic growth we are looking for. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I've
sign is tomorrow right there. Is there any questions you want to do? Or you wanted to ask the president, but. <laughs> And the government has a lot of economic incentives. And the whole idea is to tax or to, pro to generate an economic incentive in order to reduce carbon emission. So if you want to pollute, you will pay. That's it. And that will take a lot of measures in order to reduce the carbon consumption in your own house, to switch from, from coal to natural gas, for instance, that is happening in the state. It is good. But in the future, gas will be like a, like a bridge fuel, fossil fuel, it's a transition fossil fuel. But in the future, I hope that we will switch all the way to renewable. Third, the government can, well, I'm very skeptical about, to be honest, to reduce taxes. Because when you are a taxpayer, definitely it sounds great. When you, when you are in the government, oh my god, I need more money, no? You need to close the deficit, no? But wait, that's a different thing. That's, you raise that. <laughs> Third is public policy is the name of the game. You want to have that beautiful house, no? The suburbs, no? You need to pay a little bit more property tax. But if you want to promote some kind of densification, you need to reduce the taxes associated with densification, you know? But if you are charging the very same tax to the people living in an apartment and the people living in a very beautiful big space, Complete, it's against this trend. No? You are subsidizing, for instance, to leave the street, no, the support by building and building, building new highways and highways. You are promoting exactly the contrary of what we're looking for. No? Then, the back, where, where? Okay. I, so, uh, I'll go first. Uh, as a man's candidate, it's an honor to hear you uh, today. Uh, you. My question is the following. Uh, what do you think is the correlation between how we measure profit as in the private sector? Uh, in terms of impacting climate change. So uh, there's no transparency as to what is, uh, for example, when you're calculating a profit, what is the upside in terms for the environment? And that has contributed for the uh, market to invest in companies that we don't actually know uh, how to measure what's the uh, impact they're having. So uh, do you think there's a correlation uh, with that? And if so, is there any measure that you've thought of uh, on changing? As a actually, it's quite an interesting question. Already, a lot of companies, and big companies, even oil companies are estimating some kind of internal carbon price. So they are associated with the footprint with the cost of carbon. Carbon could be estimated that the global, there is a global market for carbon, very rudimentary, it's not working very well. But it's possible to say that a ton of carbon has a price of X or E or Y. And a lot of companies are establishing like a liability, the internal price of carbon. And for some companies, that is mandatory. I'll, to be honest, a lot of companies are doing the right thing in that field. For instance, 
a pension fund in Toronto, they mandate to the trust to invest 88% 80, of the total fund in renewable energy. Oh, Stanford University, I'm sorry to mention that. <laughs> Stanford University Trust, are they getting any investment from coal? Anyone? Norway Sovereign, Sovereignty, Sovereign, Fund, are divesting from coal. So that is happening in a lot of companies. It is possible to estimate the internal, internally the cost of polluting, to say that. And in the future, that's going to be some kind of rule, a common rule, a mandatory rule, but I'm very sure sooner or later that is going to happen. You will be obligated to estimate your food carbon footprint because you will pay for your carbon footprint, and that will produce a reduction, a natural transition to the low carbon economy. Now, a uh, woman, if that is possible. Yeah, here. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I do repeat what the young said. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And as a current, I guess one of like the concept of immigration and climate change, I recently came across a study that said that the biggest influx of refugees will be because of all these climate disasters happening all over the world in the next incoming decades. So as a high school student, what that currently studies in the US, what do you think would be the best um, mode of action for me to take against the current administration that is really against climate change and things that even it's opposed? Which administration? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, talking about immigration, uh, definitely there is one source of immigration. Ah, uh, there's a big issue that I believe in. Or in the case of Mexico, for instance, now immigration to the United States of Mexican workers is negative. So the net flow of Mexican workers to the United States is negative, meaning. More Mexican workers are going back to Mexico than the other way around. Most of the immigrants right now are coming from Central America, and I believe they are escaping from violence and insecurity. But that's a different thing. It's, it's what like a marketing thing about Mexican workers, immigration, all the stuff we say. Well, yes, in some cases, Al Gore made a very good point. There was a terrible drought in the Middle East by the year 2000, 2001, to the year 2006 or 2007. And he associates, a lot of people associate that terrible drought in the Middle East, in Jordan and Syria, with the civil war in Syria that provoked a lot of immigrants and refugees to Europe and all the mess that Syria has right now. So, and there are other, definitely a lot of uh, uh, farmers and people living in a rural area that definitely they need to emigrate. So that is going to be. Uh, is already now a, a source of immigration. And about the administration of uh, President Trump, do you know he has been so aggressive against all this kind of measure? What has happened? He doesn't deter significantly the movement because most of the movement is taken at local level by the authorities. In the case of the state of Massachusetts, talking about solar cells, Massachusetts state has incredible programs associated to incentives to get solar cells in the roof, for instance. Or California. Uh, or, and second, the initiative now is in, a very, in the hands of the private sector. Companies are establishing unilateral commitments. I serve in a company, Avant Grid, for instance, a utility. And they are investing a lot in renewable. They will build a beautiful wind park uh, in the Atlantic, uh, so they, so the president can say a lot of things, but the movement is on and on and on. So we need to foster that. No? Well, now one boy, yeah, yeah. So this, this concept of that you can do well, that is really interesting and it's inspiring for the future of the world. Um, but countries still enact policy as if there were a trade-off between economic prosperity and climate change, right? And a lot of emerging Asian economies um, trying to, to defect from those international treaties in order to, to continue their economic growth. So these mechanisms that you talked about, the incentives domestically to foster green, green technologies, how do you foster that kind of behavior on an international scale where players are incentives to defect from, from the Well, where, where are you from? Okay. No, I believe that it's a question of public policy. Again, 
uh, as a government, you need to establish the right economic incentives to do the transition. And in, in terms of public investment, you need to invest much more in the new kind of cities we need than the current model we have. We need to cancel new investment in fossil fuels or to reduce that. But it's the very same. So the, the, the point we, we make is there is not, that trade-off is not exactly true. You, get, you don't need to sacrifice economic growth. You can do it in the right way. The point is, if we hesitate, uh, we are not getting the benefits of the first movers, if I can say that. Mexico has a huge potential, huge potential, in terms of uh, renewable energy, for instance. We have the average hours of sun in Mexico be like a, an old guy, like a nine and a half, no? So you are very welcome to the Mexican sun, by the way, at <laughs> time, no? And the people in Monterrey, for instance, there are a lot of industries using uh, natural gas, for instance. It's good. It's better than coal and it's better than oil. But the future is associated with, energy, with solar energy. And the curious thing is, by doing so, those companies will get a lot of profits and they don't realize that. A lot of profits and polluting them. So it is possible. You, you need to, if you consider it's not exactly that trade-off. We have in the mind that there is a trade-off. Well, we sacrifice economic growth. No, the answer is not. Uh, now it's possible. Is there a woman? woman? Yeah. Um, I think we're right there. Um, I think the topic is really, really interesting. And I'm wondering more if you can, like, the gap, oh, uh, the gap between the planning and the implementation. It's, it's based on the context and the cultural uh, and the mindset you have. And a lot of uh, developing economies have a very short run con like mindset. How, how can we, um, I don't know, change that behavior, that mindset for them to think in the long run and then see that, that the cost and then all the, all the positive impact this can have? Well, basically, the strategy of the commission is we realize that threatening and scaring people about the consequences of climate change, which is true, was not working. Either people don't like to hear about the catastrophe, or the leaders say, well, I don't care about that. It was not working. There was a, some kind of negation, no? Denial? Denial of that. So we prefer to talk about the benefits of the change instead of the catastrophe of no change. So in other words, we prefer, instead to talk about the, the, how horrible will be hell, we prefer to talk about how beautiful will be promised land. And that's much better. Heaven is beautiful. And we need to, 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 to change that. Human, sometimes we have in politics or in society, with all respect, there is a lot of hair behavior. No? People imitate a lot what else is doing. So we need to provoke a massive change in that. And we need to widespread it is. We need to provide scientific arguments, but economic arguments also. Uh, and finally, one point which is important to mention. The real problem, to be honest, is financing the change. Take the case of renewable energy. Renewable energy implies a lot of upfront cost. But afterwards, it's almost tending to zero operational cost, right? But if you can, in financial terms, is to, to that positive net present value, you need to carry on from the future to the present. What's the name of that financing? So we need to reorient the financial institutions, including the World Bank and the IMF and the Inter-American Development Bank, to stop financing the old system and to finance the new climate economy. We need to educate uh, students like you in order to go back to your country and to design a finance project or project finance with this model. Yes, up front we need capital, we need uh, some kind of, we need to borrow money, but it's affordable, it's payable, it's profitable. So how to design all those mechanisms, how to train the people, we call that, what is the expression we use in the last report, it's like a Investing 
in investors or investing in financing, we're creating human capabilities, human capacity to design financial mechanisms to bring to the present the benefits of the future. But it's possible. Well, quick three questions simultaneously because I need to live really. Oh my God, where was? <laughs> I mean, I'll, 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 one, I, huh? the blue. Yeah, on the, okay, in the corner, then the blue, and then yourself. Or, yeah, both of you. Ah, go ahead, quickly. Uh, I actually worked with the UN and we worked on uh, the SDGs and actually quite closely with the Mexican government as well. So, form of PR and uh, that was all the past two recent years. So, I guess, I mean, you know, my question here is that the narrative here is that we can keep doing more with this and we can keep becoming more efficient and efficient and efficient. But, you know, I mean, the elephant in the room is the concept of efficiency versus sufficiency and also planetary boundaries. I mean, although, you know, it's quite scientifically sound, the concept of planetary boundaries, and there's a uh, latest. Uh, the newest model uh, by the Stockholm Resilience Center is also just being launched earlier in the week. So the question here is in the discourse on public policy with governments, why is there still so much of an apprehension to talk about basic parity boundaries? You know what I mean? Because right. the person is saying it be more with less, but, but that's not entirely true. We can't even you know, go over that. A lot of your presentation focused on urban planning, the way cities can be designed and so on. I just want to hear your thoughts on rural electrification and how you think about climate change and providing more power to rural communities, which is a different set of issues that are off grid, that are far away from the urban centers and so on. Yeah. Uh, you? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you also talked about it, and the entire world is also talking about it. So a lot of innovation is happening in the renewable energy space, which brings about that innovation and the breakthrough in the electricity center. But then I just feel that maybe we are right now still not addressing the liquid alternate fuel, which right now is needed because liquid, liquid, liquid alternate fuel such as biofuel or yeah. some ethanol blending or some clean red or some kind of technology. Because anyways, uh, electric vehicle is something which is pivotal on the breakthrough in the energy storage space, which is still a far uh, fetched technological thing. Right. Then the question is if you believe the incoming Campbell administration has the capacity to implement the changes that are necessary. Narrative. Uh President Santos knows it very well. The, we were talking about a who who told me that say that the South is a narrative is to we didn't have a narrative. But the point is politics is about narratives. You need to provide a good narrative to win this battle. Who's, who's the name wins? Huh? Who's the name wins? Something like that. Yeah. The narrative is the name of the game. If we are talking about the disaster, but it's like a, you know, you make a scene, you will go to hell. That's so boring. Oh, come on. So we need to talk about, about a more positive, constructive, and provocative narrative. And it is the only way in which I believe we can win this battle. But the good news is, because you say the American expression, the cavalry is on its way. Because the new generation of voters are completely committed with the environment. Completely. They're in the opinion poll with kids or people uh, uh, under 20, 80% of them are absolutely committed with climate change. Those are the new voters, and they have the new nerve. Meanwhile, we need to build a different strategy, and this is a different strategy, definitely. I believe these kind of strategies associated with the economic benefits change the mood that allow Paris Agreement to take place. So that is possible. Uh, a rural area, well, uh, the, the name of this is, I mean, should you should find my And here this is the we are. Distributed energy. What is uh, South of Africa or Sub-Saharan African countries? They don't have electricity at home, rural areas. Is there the solution, the traditional one, to establish a very expensive polluting cables all the way down? Or distributed energy is the answer? That is the answer. What happened with, did you know, maybe you at home, we are too old to be honest, but in our homes, there are fixed lines, fixed lines in the phone. And actually, 
the goal for any government was to generate, like at least 90% of homes in Mexico needs to have fixed lines of phone, telephone. What's happened in India? Oh, everywhere, forget it. The new technology is mobile phones. Nobody needs fixed lines. No one. That can happen with energy. You get to have the batteries, and this is another issue for technology. If the battery allow us to preserve and store its energy, you will have distributed energy. You don't need grids anymore in those rural areas. You don't need transmission lines. You don't need to spend a lot of polluting steel investment. That is the solution. That is the future. It's feasible. We need to, to make some kind of a uh, David, the, uh, David King in the United Kingdom. He says about the Apollo project. When President Kennedy, glory of this big school, <laughs> President Kennedy said, we will put a man in the moon. That's the Apollo project. And they spent a lot of money, all a lot of scientists, NASA, everything in order to get the man in the moon. They got it. We need exactly an Apollo project in storage energy. And it's feasible. The investment associated, public money associated with research, currently is half in real terms that it was 25 years ago. The government are spending less in innovation. She says, stupid. We need a new Apollo project to design a battery able to capture in the, in the day the sunlight or the wind, and storage that, and for one home or one community to provide the energy they need without any grid. That's the point. Uh, yeah, I, I believe in, in biofuels, but we need to take care of that. We need to do carefully the maths associated with carbon emission, ethanol, for instance. I suffer a lot, by the way, with when President W. Bush, George W. Bush decided to subsidize ethanol from corn, suddenly the price of the tortilla in Mexico went up. <laughs> so we the Mexicans eat, you know, on average per family, one kilo a day. One kilo a day per family. And then when the price went up from four pesos to eight pesos, oh my god, I was going to be killed as president. <laughs> Like me, all the way. So, subsidizing corn for ethanol, subsidizing very polluting fertilizers, is not exactly like a carbon emission reduction project. You know? There are other uh, bioenergy associated with a lot of residual debris from logging or bio residuals in, in, in natural sources or algae. A lot of bio sources of energy, which completely agree with that. We need to take care and do the right math in order to make, don't make mistakes in that. And related with the last question, I have no time. I'm, I'm sorry. To... <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I hope this guy could understand. Uh, I have serious concerns. You know what he said when he was in campaign? He saw some uh, wind generators a wind farmer in La Rumorosa between Tecate and Tijuana. When he arrived to Mexicali, he said, well, I'm very disappointed. Those ugly uh, wind uh, molinos, he say, mills, those ugly mills from eotic, eotic, energia eotica, eotic energy uh, are only in the interest of the Americans, something like that. So, and recently, he's building a refinery, you know, and logging down. Already, they locked down all the field. In, um, well, uh, I'm thinking about the the mind we had like a 40 years ago. 40 years ago, we used to say, as no, we need to invest a lot in oil and gas in order to preserve the production. We need to preserve the no renewable sources for future generation. That was the logic in the 70s. I shared that logic at the same time. But now the logic is completely different. We need to create the renewable sources of energy for future generations. This is the other way around. And the other day, he said, we need to preserve 
actually, he, he didn't say natural resources, no renewable natural resources. He said, we need to preserve the no renewable sources of energy for future generation. I believe, I hope that he can get around him people knowing those matters. Um, if not, we need to do the case. And again, it's a, it's a battle in public opinion to gain persuasion. That's the reason I, it's a pleasure to me to stay today here.